Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Hello. Um, welcome to the webinar with Dr. Henning Beck on the brain versus artificial intelligence, new ideas in a digital world. So first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. And um, we're very excited to present to you the first collaboration between Podium and Zebra Insights. Podium, a leading speakers agency and digital events creator based in Germany, and Zebra Insights, an AI powered speakers agency. Uh, I'm Brendan Warren. I'm COO at Zebra Insights. Um, so Zebra Insights has closely collaborated with Podium for the past few years to build a very strong uh, partnership. And so um, what we do at Zebra Insights is we combine human and artificial intelligence to deliver unique keynote speakers and moderators for our clients' corporate events. As a boutique uh, firm that's very global in nature, uh, we work with leading banks, uh, multinational corporations, and also events management companies. All of the work that we do is bespoke. Um, so what we do is we go to the market to find very impressive speakers that are perfectly matched with the DNA of our clients' events. Um, so you may ask uh, why the zebra? What, it is, what is it about, about the zebra? Um, so I would ask you, did you know that each set of zebra stripes are unique like a human fingerprint? Um, our approach to working on each client project is similarly unique and bespoke. No two client events are the same, just like no two zebras have the same set of stripes. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about Zebra Insights, but enough about us. Um, Christine is joining us today uh, from Podium Studio in Frankfurt, and she will tell you a little bit more about the collaboration and also about today's speaker, Dr. Henning Beck. Uh, so Christine, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Brandon, for this very kind introduction. My name is Christine Pogge. I'm uh, the founder and uh, the co-owner of the agency Podium. We have offices in Frankfurt and Cologne. And uh, I would like um, to welcome our clients and the clients of Zebra Insights to our first joint international talk, which we will stream live today from the Podium studio here in Frankfurt, Germany. Yes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Podium. Um, the speaker agency was founded 19 years ago. Um, our spe speciality is the personal individual consulting of our clients. The discovery of new speaker talents and an extensive network, especially in the German speaking area. We love to think ahead and shape the future. That's why we excited about our cooperation with Zebra Insights. Together, we now have a comprehensive international speaker portfolio. We are also excited about how Zebra Insights is rethinking our speaker business um, with a new uh, technolo technolo te oh, sorry. <laughs> technolo technology um, um, yes, um, perspective. Tech and we are pleased to be able to contribute, contribute this joint journey into the future with many top speakers and personalities from Germany, but also, but also from the Germany speaking area. Um, yes, and we are also happy that we can, uh, yeah, uh, also our great deal of know-how gained through almost 20 years of experiences. Because if you want to act globally, you need a strong regional network. Okay, we have a second business I like to introduce very short. Um, this is a business field of speaker management um, of a few selected personalities. This includes our guest today, Dr. Henning Beck. And together with him, we have built this highly professional green screen studio in the heart of Frankfurt during the COVID pandemic, from which you can experience us live today. Please be sure to write your questions in the Q&A box, as you will have today the opportunity to ask everything you ever wanted to know about the human brain. That's your chance to ask everything you like to want. That's because our guest speaker today is Dr. Henning Beck. Henning. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, uh, thanks for having you? me. It's a pleasure. Yes. Yeah. And, and I like to give our, um, 
also our clients, the clients of Ziba Insights and our attendees, uh, very short introduction to learn about more about you. And I have make some notes. <laughs> yes, Henningbeck is a new scientist, a biochemist, and a best selling author. Henning supports businesses to use brain approaches in order to improve innovative thinking. He did his PhD in Tübingen and Ulm and worked for startups in the San Francisco area Bay to push better ideas. As a thought after speaker, he takes a look behind the scenes of the most flawed, but also most innovative system in the world, the brain itself. Completely inefficient, but more powerful than any kind of supercomputer. An effective network thinker, more agile than an optimized company you know of. Stay turned, uh, sorry, stay tuned to experience how brains differ from machines and how we gain the ultimate cognitive edge now and in future. Henning, the stage is yours. Yeah, th thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to give the initial and very first talk in this uh, cooperation uh, between Zebra Insights and, I'm very and, and Podium, and I'm very happy to get the opportunity today. And yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to give my input about the topics you, you mentioned, and especially how we think and change the world. The brain versus artificial intelligence, or in other words, who's holding the upper hand in our future? The brain with its unique biological capacities or the rising stars of machine learning and algorithmic thinking? My name is Henning Beck. I'm a biochemist and neuroscientist by profession. I studied in Tübingen and Ulm, Germany, worked in Berkeley, California for one year where we investigated how the brain actually is able to create new ideas, what a good idea makes us unique in how we differ from artificial intelligence. And this is what I'm particularly interested here in Frankfurt and mine right now. How does the brain differ from artificial intelligence? How does the brain accomplish innovative ways of thinking? And what has to happen in our working environment in order to support that capacities that our, that our brain is, is showing? So when you ask people, what is the most important resource of our times? Many people say, okay, it is data. Companies collect data. We analyze data. We want to benefit from data. We correlate data and so much. But never forget, data itself is dead. Uh, data is just letters and numbers you can process electronically, but they have no meaning in itself. Never ever in human history has data changed the world. Right? Human beings change the world with our interpretation, with our knowledge, with our understanding, with our ideas. And interesting, you can measure data, but you cannot measure having an idea. You cannot measure innovation. You cannot measure knowledge. There's no metric. There's no quantifiable scale for knowledge or having an idea. You cannot say one meter of knowledge, one kilogram of idea. And because of that, the brain has to have some kind of tricks, some kind of secret mental weapons when it comes to organize information in a unique and creative way. So when you apply data to describe a certain situation or a certain problem, you end up with something different. This is what we call information. And information is all around us. You know, the smartphone at our fingertips, the internet always on the go, but never mix up having knowledge or acquiring an idea with data or information. You can Google data if you're good. You can Google information, but you cannot Google an idea. You cannot Google knowledge because having an idea, acquiring knowledge, this is what is happening on your mind when you change the way you think. And I'm gonna prove that in the next yeah, 20 or so minutes that this will stay analog in our close future because this is what makes us human beings so unique and so superior to any kind of algorithm you know of. So everything you see here, everything you are experiencing right now at this very moment is just the surface of what is going on in reality. Most of the things run subconsciously, which makes it very hard to investigate, but even more interesting. So let's zoom into the brain to check out what is actually thinking there, hopefully, and how can we make use of that? So first, just a few words about the brain in general. 
when you ask people, how does the brain actually work? Okay, many people say the brain is something like, like a supercomputer, right? The ultimate calculating engine we are carrying in our head. And many people say, okay, the brain is extremely fast. It is super connected with the big and vast amount of neuronal networks, and it is very precise in its actions, and thereby much more powerful than any kind of computer, because what can you do with this one? Okay, this one is at least stylish. It has some appeal on your desktop, but that's it, right? Well, look at this again, and you see it's totally the other way around. A computer that can be placed on your desktop is extremely fast, easily calculates 3.4 billion times a second. Neurons in your brain much slower, maximum calculation speed, 500 operations per second. Computers roughly do any mistake. An approximation is that they, a current Intel chip does one error in a trillion operations. Brains, on the other hand, well, you probably know that from your daily life, at least I do, we do mistakes a billion times as often. And computers can be plugged to the internet and you're connected with the world contrary to the brain because the brain is 99% of its time dealing with itself. Yeah? And most of the cells never see what's going on in reality. Most of the neurons never get in touch with the outside world. So from this perspective, you have to say, the brain is everything but perfect. From this perspective, you have to say, the brain is, is, is lame, is, it is lousy, and it is selfish, and still it is working. Yeah? Look around you, working brains wherever you look. And the reason for this is that we totally think differently than any kind of digital and computer system you know of. And many engineers from the AI field haven't figured out that massive difference, that massive difference yet, but it is very important because this um, shows you how the brain actually understands the world. And it's not just analyzing data around you, but it's really creating meaning out of the sensory input. And this is, this is the core of our, human, of our human way of thinking. And maybe, maybe in a nutshell, what is needed for, for a future world that is changing so rapidly. Adapt, adaptability, the, the, the competence to change your way of thinking according to changing environment. This is maybe the most important human strength, strength we are having. And uh, the brain has some kind of trick to do that. And instead of explaining the theoretical background, what is happening on a physiological level in the brain, I give you an example. I give you an example how the brain uses that, what we call conceptual thinking, in order to create something new and in order to understand the world instead of just analyzing. So here's, here's the experiment or, or the task. Who thinks that this object here is a chair? Well, I'll feel your confirmation virtually. And I would say, okay, this is a chair. This, is, this isn't anything complicated. Okay, this is a chair, easy stuff. So if you say that this object here is a chair, would you agree that these objects here are also chairs? Maybe you are familiar with furniture and you say, okay, these objects here are chairs. I would say easy stuff, no brainer, so to say. Nothing complicated. Okay, here's the task. If you say that these objects here are chairs, would you say that these objects are chairs too or can be used as chairs? Yeah, why is this blue ball with three stumps a chair or this strange design object here? Because you can sit on it. And what you see here is the difference, the main difference between the computer world and the brain world. What you see up here, this is what you know from the media. This is what we call artificial intelligence or machine learning, deep learning based on big data analysis, you name it. Basic principle, you give, a, you give a self-learning algorithm. You give it a gazillion of images and super many images of chairs and cats and so on. And you let it analyze the whole bunch of data, finding correlations and uh, analyses, finally turning out that the chair is an object with, I don't know, 98% certainty, an object with four legs, a seat, and a backrest. But we don't do that. Human beings don't do that. We understand that the chair is not a specifically shaped object, but something you can sit on. And once you understood that concept, that principle, you see chairs everywhere. You can create completely new chairs with new features and new designs. Learning is great. 
learning by heart, deep learning, machine learning, massive learning. Learning is great, but learning isn't anything special in nature. I mean, all kinds of animals learn. Blackbirds learn, dolphins learn, elephants learn, computers learn, we understand. When you learn something, you can unlearn it. But once you understood it, you cannot de-understand it again. Well, in most cases, I know some special cases, private stuff, but usually it sticks. You, you know that moment, you know that aha moment when you say, ah, oh, I got it, I understood it. And suddenly from one second to the next, your, your way of thinking completely changes. And this is the main difference in our world. And this is the question we have to ask ourselves. What is our main goal in the future? Do we want people that are following that kind of principle, analyzing a whole bunch of data, finally finding some correlations, learning by heart, cramming information inside your head? I mean, this is what you can read in, in, in books and in self-help literature all over. Some mental trick to cram your head with so many information and still stay focused and efficient. But this is not what human beings are really good at. Human beings are good at getting distracted, at mentally drifting away, doing something else, and thereby, anal thereby understanding the world and give meaning to, to stuff. And this is the reason why I'm not afraid of artificial intelligence taking over. I'm not afraid. There's another reason, my neighbor. He visited me a couple of years ago, and he was three years old at that day. And he walked into my apartment, stood in the hallway, looked up at a ceiling and said by his own, without asking him, he said, oh, smoke detector. And I was like, what? <laughs> what kind of parents does this little boy have? I mean, are they showing him like an artificial intelligence system? They are showing him thousands of images of, um, of smoke detectors, fire axes, fire extinguishers, and so on. Probably not. I mean, his father is a professional firefighter. This might play a role. Hmm, yeah. But we know from lab studies that children understand the meaning of stuff at first or second or third sight. You give them a giraffe, a car, an airplane to play with, and they understand the meaning of that. After one or two or three contexts, they, they, they um, recognize airplanes on, in videos and, and different sizes, different types of airplanes. Children do that. We do this as well. You do this all the time. How long did it take you to understand the word Brexit? Uh, you did not learn this word by heart. You have seen that word only once or twice in the media, but that was, was enough for you to understand the meaning of that word. You did not learn it. You understood it. This is something different because once you understood it, you can do stuff with it. When you know what a Brexit is, what could a Swexit be? Or an Etuxit, a Spuxit, never seen the word Swexit before. You might have a rough estimation what kind of Scandinavian country is waving goodbye to the European Union here. Or even more, when you know what a Brexit is, you might also understand why what a Bremain could be, or maybe a return is about to happen in the future. Hope never dies. Here you see that we are not um, data analysis, uh, data analyzing machines in in the human body. Data, as I as I've said, has no meaning for us. I mean, this poor guy differs from this happy one in fifty percent in its data. But for us, it is 100% difference because we are not interested in data. We are interested in what can we do with that? Are we able to create a new idea, play around with that? And people often ask me, okay, Henning, this is all cool, but how is this happening in the brain? What kind of, what kind of anatomical tricks does the brain have in order to improve that thinking? Or where in the brain are these new ideas and new thoughts actually happening? And to make it more clear and to show you how the brain actually works in this specific situation, I brought you a model of the brain here. And when you open the brain and check out what is actually happening inside, inside the brain when we are thinking and creating new ideas, first thing to realize, there is no such thing like a creativity area. No matter how deeply you look into the brain, you will never find a thought. You will never find an idea. Because an idea is what is happening when different areas in the brain interact with each other. It all starts with concentration, that you are focusing on a specific topic, like right now, hopefully, you are listening to me watching this video. And this is happening in frontal parts of the brain, um, where you are putting focus on, on things and, and uh, concentrate on stuff. 
you know that we are, we are world class in drifting away and not paying attention. And so the brain has to activate a different region more deeply located in the brain that is basically prioritizing what is important and what is not important, what has to re be remembered, what, what, can be, what can be discarded. And um, at night or when you're, when you're doing a break, when you are sleeping, this region trains other regions in the brain um, to, um, to prioritize certain, certain information and certain thoughts. And then when you are awake and are doing nothing, nothing specific, I have to say, not paying attention to a certain task, but when you are vacuum cleaning your apartment, when you are bike riding, when you are taking a shower, when you are driving a car, when you are walking the dog, a different region kicks in. And this region actually is necessary for connecting different thoughts and inspiration from outside. So finally, the brain can again focus on the, on the first problem and thereby being able to create a new perspective for the first problem. So it's about concentration, prioritization, and drifting away and doing something different. Okay, so far so good. But how is all this, or how can this be accomplished in a working environment? There are different theories and different ideas how a good workspace environment, a good office design should look like in order to support that kind of thing. Is it about um, big working environments? Is it about um, working areas where you have um, multiple and flexible working spaces, or is it, is it about that you are sitting in a small office for your own? What is the most brain-friendly working environment in our, digital, in our digital working area? And interestingly, there are, as I've shown you before, there are different aspects of our way of thinking. I mean, we are not thinking the same way throughout the day. Um, there are phases at the day where we are more concentrated. There are phases where we are more in a communicative style, where we are awake and engaged with a, with a problem, or sometimes we need to drift away, uh, getting inspiration or relaxation. And there are different ideas how all this can be, can be accomplished in our, in our working environment. And what do we have to put focus on? And when we ask people, many people say, okay, what is most important in a good brain-friendly working environment that, that fosters creative thinking? Many people say, oh, it, is, it is about engagement. So people are awake and actively paying attention to a certain problem. And also communication, super important. Communicating with different, with different um, employees in the company is super important. Well, yes and no. When we check out what is actually good for, for our way of thinking, we see as exactly as I've shown you before in the brain, it is a difference. Or is it, it, um, you have to distinguish between three different aspects of thinking. First, it is about concentration. Um, we have done so many brainstormings in California for creative, creative uh, processes, but never ever we did a brainstorming to find a solution. We always did brainstormings to concentrate on the problem, to find the problem, to ask questions. And the more you dig into the problem, the more you focus on something, the more questions you ask, um, the more possibilities you have to solve that problem in a unique way after that. And also keep in mind, we are living in times where we are overkilled by so many information around us. We are not living in times like decades ago where it was complicated to find the information. No, today we have the opposite problem. We have so many information that we have to concentrate on the problem in specific information, in specific working situations and not be distracted um, by other incoming information. This is, this is um, important, especially when you want to get a good ideas. Second, okay, step back from the problem, of course. If you are, if you're always paying attention and never stepping back, you're, you're not able to get to the bird's view, not able to see the whole thing. Communication is key, of course. And I'll show you in a couple of seconds how this can be done. And last but not least, relax. Step back from the problem totally. I mean, catching a break is necessary in order to refill your mental capacities. And as a rule of thumb, you can say that it's, it's five to one. Five parts of work, one part of doing a break. So 50 minutes working, 10 minutes catching a break. Uh, and this is important. When I was in California, I have seen people that who earned billions of dollars by selling products like apps and mobile devices. 
but I've never seen a smart brain in the Silicon Valley, in the Silicon Valley that is not having a hobby or some parts of the day where he or she cannot be reached. So when you are, dry, uh, when you are riding a bike or when you are um, playing the piano or when you, are, when you are walking the dog, these people have um, periods throughout the day, thinking periods that, that are blocked in the schedule where they cannot be reached. And they're in this specific, um, in this specific moment, they are able to, to, to think over a problem without being distracted and digest all the information they have been confronted with before. And after that, get back to the initial problem, concentrate, step back, communicate with others, ask others, ask non-experts. I have never seen a single project that did not benefit from asking a non-expert. Some guy who's asking naive questions, who's putting a new perspective on a problem, super important. And then do nothing. And don't underestimate the brain needs these specific um, phases of doing nothing and doing a break in order to be able to be more than just, just a dumb computer. Computers don't do, any, um, don't do any breaks. They never sleep. What a surprise. They never get to get to good ideas because it is necessary to step back from the problem before that. And as I've shown you before, or uh, exactly right here, that it is important to have this typical way of communication. The question is, how can this be accomplished? Communication is key in our times, but how can this be accomplished in our, in our working life? A good friend of mine is working for a company that does internet services for, for large enterprises, enterprises with more than 5,000, 10,000 employees. And they ask, what does the most creative minds have in common in such large companies? Is it, about, is it about intelligence? Is it about age? Is it about experience? Is it about cultural background? Is it about education? Turned out none of these things really mattered. Of course, you have to have some brain cells and you have to have some kind of intelligence in order to think about problems. Okay, this is necessary, but this is actually not enough. When you check out what is really important, they analyze the communication profile of different employees in the company. And here you see a company with three different departments uh, depicted in blue, red, and green. Wolfgang, very well connected in the blue department. A lot of connections when you are measuring who's talking to whom um, face to face, what they measured by some kind of microphone people they're wearing or who is chatting with whom, um, sending text mes messages, who is emailing with whom, who is phone calling whom. And it turned out that a guy like Wolfgang, who has a lot of connections, but unfortunately only in the blue department, is not as creative like compared to Anneliese, who is not having so many connections compared to Wolfgang, but she's having the different ones in the blue, the red, and the green department. Put it this way, Anneliese does not have to be the brightest candle on the cake but she has to sit at this hub, at this interface of different, um, of different departments. This is the reason why we get to good ideas when we are returning from vacation. Same problem, different environment, new perspective, new solution. This is the reason why big cities are per capita more innovative than small cities. Not because people are brighter or more intelligent in big cities, but the likelihood of meeting someone who's giving you feedback, who's contradicting, who's supporting, who's giving any new input is way bigger in big cities than in small cities. And this is the reason why good projects always benefit from cross-divisional um, cross cooperation, from asking some guys from outside, not because they are showing the better, um, the better solution, but usually they, they, give a good, they give a good question. They ask questions that nobody ever asked before and thereby giving you some kind of, some kind of uh, new perspective and new input on a certain problem. Or as Abraham Lincoln put it, he said, I don't like this man, I have to get to know him better. And this open-mindedness, this thinking outside of your comfort zone of, of, of the box, if you want, this is so necessary and decisive um, for good and creative and innovative uh, corporations and enterprises. And third, it is important that you have the great, uh, a great uh, brain-friendly working environment, concentration, um, communication, relaxation, and um, you need uh, the, the, this communication um, 
idea or mindset, but that's not enough. Importantly, what makes us unique and, and um, separates us from non-creative machines is some kind of, some kind of mindset that, um, that we are using to get to, um, to get to good ideas by doing mistakes. The saying that artificial intelligence is about to take over the world, ruling the world. This is all over the media right now, and you find it in, in every second tweet um, of Elon Musk's. Um, but this was in the media um, almost exactly on the day ago in 1997. In May 1997, Gary Kasparov, the chess, world chess champion at that time, was beaten by a chess program called Deep Blue by IBM. Never ever after that incident, a human being was able to beat the best chess program in the world. So far, so good. What only a few people know is how the machine took the win. You have to know that this chess match consisted of six different games. The situation on the chess board in game number two was pretty clear. Standard situation short before the end game, Kasparov played black, the machine played white. And suddenly the machine did a strange move. The machine sacrificed a pawn without anything in return. And Kasparov was like, what is happening here? This is an unlogic, non-machine-like move. No logic machine would ever do that kind of move. And no one had ever seen this kind of move in this specific situation in chess history before. And he was so, so irritated, he lost conscious. Uh, he lost conscious. He lost concentration. He was still conscious, of course. He lost concentration. He was not able to beat the machine after that, after that incident, despite the fact he had the better position on the chessboard. And after he lost the final match game number six, the engineers by IBM were allowed to check out in the protocols what had happened before. Why did the machine do this strange move? And they found out in this specific situation, game number two, the the chess program was overloaded. In order to not break down, the IBM engineers had installed something they called a panic mode that allowed the machine in this critical situation just to play a random move. I'm telling you this story for three different reasons. First, this was the first and maybe the last time in history a machine was truly creative. Second, um, it is not always perfection that takes the win. And third, it shows you how not to deal with a mistake. IBM fired the engineers after that because the machine was not flawless. It was buggy. They teared down the machine, put it to a museum, and never followed up the idea that's the clever mistake in our thinking that separates us from non-creative machines. Today's machines are perfect. Yeah, machines are beating us at every kind of game. Yeah, poker, Monopoly, you name it. But they're not doing this because they are reinventing this game in a creative way. They are just avoiding any kind of mistake. And if you're playing against a human being, this is a super cool strategy because human beings will do a mistake eventually. But it's also super boring. If two perfect chess engines are playing against each other, it's always a draw. But nobody's, nobody's watching this. And no, no, none of these machines will ever change the world. When we analyze what is happening in the brain, when we are doing a mistake, then we, we see that a lot of different areas are active, but one region is missing, the region for fear. Human beings are not afraid of making a, a, a mistake initially. No child is afraid of starting to speak. We are taught that mistakes are bad. And of course, a lot of mistakes are bad. If you want to build a car, don't do any mistakes. If you want to drive a car, don't do any mistake. But if you want to reinvent mobility, invent a new car of the future, you have to go places nobody has ever been before. And this ultimately means that you are daring a mistake and you don't know whether your idea is gonna fly or not, but not risking is it. This is um, making a mistake by default because all the great ideas come um, with a price tag of it's maybe a mistake, but if you're not doing this, you will be screwed eventually. Second, as I've shown you before in the talk, support cross-divisional thinking. This is, this is the great treasure um, companies and corporations are having. The, the know-how of the employees and the best ideas are already inside the company. The trick is to get people together, um, especially in informal situations. Good friend of mine working for a software company in, in Switzerland, they found out that by doubling the size of the tables, 
in the in the eating in the eating areas, they increase cross divisional crosstalk um, in a very informal way. They found out that cross department um, cooperation increased after that, and the and the code and the code output increased two months later. And this is shown over and over again that the more you support that kind of crosstalk, um, the more innovative your company will get. And third, mix different working environments, as I've shown you before. There is no such thing that one place where human beings are working efficiently throughout the day. This is just as ridiculous as the idea that you are living in your apartment in only one room. One room for, for going to the bathroom, for eating something, for sleeping something, for working, for your living room, everything packed together in one room. You don't do that. You have different rooms according to different life situations, going to the bathroom, going to the kitchen. But what a ridiculous idea that this should not be the case in a working environment. You have to be different rooms for concentration, different areas for, for relaxation, different areas for communication. And the best ideas happen when you change or the different rooms and get from one room to another room. And what is the best idea that is happening in the future that is changing in the, in the world? I have no clue. But I'm pretty sure it will be created by brains, not by artificial intelligence. Not because we are smarter or more efficient or more intelligent than machines or algorithms, but the opposite. We are slower. We are irrational. We are imperfect. We are drifting away. We are forgetting stuff. We are making mistakes. But we are learning from our failures. We get support from our, from our friends, from our, from our colleagues. And we are understanding in, instead of just analyzing the world. And this is giving us the ultimate cognitive edge we should appreciate and be more proud of because this is what makes us human. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Beck. That was a, a fantastic presentation. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, I think the one uh, key takeaway that I really liked is, is when you said uh, support cross-divisional thinking and that the best ideas are already in a company and it's just a matter of sort of um, getting people together, right? And I, and I liked uh, in particular that example you mentioned of, uh, of the company that simply built bigger tables to fit more people together. Um, I thought that was uh, very, oh, yeah, very that's, clever. That's a, cool, that's a cool story because the initial idea was um, let's do some kind of Friday evening beer meeting and everybody is together and, and drinking beer and chatting. But this was so, so wanted. So everybody was kind of forced to be creative at this very moment. And in fact, the best ideas happen when you are not planning them, when you are just creating an environment where people get together in an informal way this is the reason why um, Steve Jobs, when he designed the Pixar building, um, he, the initial idea was there's just one bathroom for the whole company of 12, uh, 1,200 employees because everybody has to go to the bathroom eventually. And then people meet from different departments. They install different uh, or more than only one bathroom. But, uh, but the idea still um, sticks to many modern um, designs of, um, of buildings, get people in touch with each other. Yeah. Great, great, very good. Um, so it's now time for us to turn to the Q&A uh, section of our, of our presentation today. Um, I'd like to remind the audience, if you do have a question for Dr. Beck, please type it into the Q&A section that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then I'll ask uh, your question to Dr. Beck. Um, so why don't I start off with uh, one question that I have. And um, Dr. Beck, I, I wanna go back to your, um, your example that you used uh, early on about your little neighbor who identified the smoke detector. And uh, I suspect that there's um, many parents or at least parents to be in the audience here today. Um, hence, my question is, um, what advice would you give um, parents from a neuroscience perspective um, about sort of how AI can help their child's uh, development? How AI or how, how parents can help uh, children development? Or both? <laughs> uh, both, why don't we go with both? <laughs> Yeah. Well, first, first of all, I mean, uh, children by default are curious. So when you are born, you are the, what the brain needs mostly is input from outside. So people are, or children are always walking around and, and are curious what, what is happening around. And the, the key is keep the curiosity as long as possible, because what we see in educational systems, usually curiosity is kind of is not destroyed, but vanishes throughout our life. We are asking less and less question, questions when we grew up. 
And um, we know that children, for instance, ask 500 to 1,000 questions a day. And uh, as you are grown up, it's maybe 10 or, or 20 questions per day. So as, as, um, as grown-ups always, or parents always encourage children to ask and ask your children as well, ask them questions. If they ask a question, try to find a solution together. We ask questions in order to let this curiosity grow as long as possible. What we know from a technological point of view, um, I get also, very often I get the question, when, do you, when uh, shall we start with uh, digital devices in education? Should we put smartphones to, or should we give uh, smartphones to children at the age of 10, 12, 14, or whatever? Um, usually we know before puberty, before let's say 30 and 14 years of age, um, um, we know that the restriction of those devices is beneficial for the development of the brain because children learn to, to think in a three-dimensional world. When you read a book and you want to remember the book, please get a printed version because you also remember where was it written, not only what, but also where in this book. So you have this three-dimensional space. So start with those devices um, around, let's say, 14 years of age in education, maybe a bit, a bit earlier, but always embedded in, uh, in, a, um, in a didactic concept. And what we know, what will be the future for education, and this is a mega trend that will last in the next decades, is that we use artificial intelligence to tailor um, educational, let's say, or didactic concepts to the specific person. So let's say in, in the future, everybody will have his or her specific, let's say, training or education profile he or she will run through. And artificial intelligence um, will um, will tailor the different um, educational environments for everybody in the future. This is this is a pretty this is a pr pretty clear trend. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Um, I now see a couple of questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to uh, pose those to you now. So, um, reading here, the first question that came in: um, As we're embracing remote and hybrid uh, working as the new normal, um, how do you address this from a neuroscience perspective? Um, how to enhance productivity and innovation. So you talked a little bit about this in your presentation. Were there certain aspects that maybe you wanted to drill into or offer uh, a little bit more nuance? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And what we know from, uh, from, from the science uh, that, um, that it is difficult to have one area or one place to feature different working styles. So if you're sitting at your desktop in your working room, um, it is difficult to be communicative, to be uh, uh, to to concentrate, to to be um, communicative, creative at the same time or at the same room. Um, so it would be better to have one room at home um, where you have a specific working style. Let's say getting uh, um, let's say different different kinds of files worked uh, worked um, um, through in a very efficient way. This can be done remotely very easily. What we see from the studies that are coming in right now from the last two years where we were forced to work remotely, we see a decrease in uh, innovation and creative potential in, uh, in companies because people are not that, let's say, inofficially getting in touch with each other when they are having lunch together, when they are meeting in the hallway um, accidentally. And um, everything is orchestrated. Everything is on purpose. We are in a Zoom call together on purpose for a specific target, for a specific task. Um, and all this informal stuff is um, kind of is kind of um, gotten rid of. So what is important in the future will be a hybrid version, a hybrid system where you have or where you offer the possibility to work remotely from home in a concentrated and dedicated way to get work done in an efficient way. And for that, you need to have a room at home that encourages this kind of um, concentrated thinking. And um, other areas, other aspects in the company where you meet your teammates and where you do um, creative collaboration with, and this, this hybrid model will be, will be the future for sure. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, another another question that we have from the audience is around um, uh, solving problems. So the question is, uh, Dr. Beck, can you please talk about solutions or systems that are created uh, to solve problems? Hmm. Solving problems. Yeah, um, there are different ways to solve problems. There, um, you can solve problems in an intelligent way, in a more analytic way. This would mean that you focus on the problem and try to dig 
as deeply as possible into the problem to, to find an efficient solution, or it's a more creative and open-minded way of finding a solution, this might include that you re-ask the question. Because intelligence is defined as a way to solve problems in a more and more efficient way. Intelligence does not mean that you change questions, that you change perspective. And this is also necessary, for instance, if you want to create a new product, a new service also. So what can we do to, to, to improve that kind, of, that kind of problem solving? Well, we know that people are very bad in solving problems when they are forced to. When you are sitting at your desktop and, and, and force people to solve a problem, this, is, this ain't gonna happen because this is, this is too, too much pressure on our brain. And we know that the brain areas that are usually necessary to drift away, to, to ask what if questions, to, to, to put yourself into the other's shoes, all these brain areas are decreased in their activity if somebody's watching you. And people get to good ideas when they feel um, unsupervised, when they, as I said, when they are during sports, for instance, at home, during commuting, uh, listening to music or so. And you have to have these phases um, mixed with phases where you really dig into the problem. And interestingly, the good ideas come when people return um, from this relaxation period. For instance, have a brainstorming, stepping back, and then when people get back to work the next day, they will come with a better idea. And this is, this is necessary because if you overdo it, this problem solving, you won't find a good creative one. All right, thank you. Um, and now the questions are just flowing in from the audience, so I'll keep uh, I'll keep throwing them at you, uh, Dr. Beck, and uh, see if you find any of them any of them challenging. Uh, the next question is about the future of neuroscience. And um, so the question is, uh, what does the future hold for neuroscience, and what are the major obstacles to the rapid development and new important discoveries in understanding our brain? <laughs> yeah, well, the under <laughs> honestly, frankly speaking, frankly speaking. We don't know how the brain works. Ooh. We know how the brain works in detail, particularly when you look at the brain cells, the biochemistry and molecular biology is pretty well understood. We know how the brain in general works. So where in the brain do we think, or do we process in optical information? Where is motoric areas? But we don't know the in-between. This is the holy grail of neuroscience. Compare it with an orchestra. If you look at an orchestra from outside and nobody is playing music, you have no idea what music this orchestra is able to play. Same with the brain. When I take a brain and I cut it and I open it and I look at the brain from outside, I have no clue how the brain actually works. So um, in an orchestra, the music emerges, the melody emerges when the music, musicians start to play with each other. Same with the brain, a thought, an idea, memories, your emotions, they are not located anywhere, but they are created by the brain cells, just like musicians when they play with each other, when the neurons play with each other and give rise to that dynamic. And we don't understand the dynamic yet. We need better technologies to do so. And there are some, some approaches for with better, um, let's say, um, yeah, uh, technologies to really get to the, to the heart of the, of the activity of, of neuronal networks. Um, but this in-between isn't figured out yet. And all there are nice and interesting examples how to do that, like Elon Musk with Neuralink, trying to basically re really read out the brain's activity at a specific moment. And, um, but this is technologically, technologically speaking, not, um, not advanced enough in order to really read out the, the, the thoughts from your mind. And I, I doubt that this will really happen in the future, but for sure, the holy grail is how does the brain actually create this dynamic? Because, by the way, this would lead to good artificial intelligence. If we know how neurons give rise to that dynamic that we call a thought, you could use that principle and copy that principle into, um, into computers uh, and thereby creating way better artificial intelligence. Just like we build airplanes, not by copying the birds the birds, um, the birds flight or birds in general, but the, the shape of the birds wing. We copy the birds wing and thereby we can create airplanes. So maybe we can copy the principle of thinking in the brain and thereby create thinking machines in the future, but this is the way to go. All right, um, very good, thank you. Um, so the next question from the audience is um, more about, they're going, going back to uh, our discussion earlier about education. So uh, the question is, is it possible to teach um, machine values to embed 
uh, to be embedded in their role in education uh, values or concepts like ethics or kindness. Essentially, you know, are these are these teachable through AI? Well, um, um, rather not, because the, uh, artificial intelligence itself has no moral or no ethics. All I've seen is statistics and mathematical modeling of, of data that can be put on a specific output. Um, what, what you cannot measure cannot be optimized by artificial intelligence. And what you cannot measure are all these kind of stuff that you know from your daily life. Happiness, for instance, um, freedom, security, um, health, education, knowledge, ideas. Um, all these things where you cannot put a metric on are very difficult to digitize. And I'm very skeptical that this can be performed throughout artificial intelligence. In fact, we, all, we already see the opposite. If, if you put in bad data sets, you will get a bad output by artificial intelligence. And there are, there are interesting and scary examples like Amazon will put an artificial intelligence system for CV scanning in action, finally churning out that the artificial intelligence discarded all the female applicants because they were by, I don't know, whatever reason, not as good as male applicants in the past or that the artificial intelligence recognized that there is a, that there is a difference. So what we see right now in science is rather an amplification of human biases, of human fallacies, of human thinking traps um, that can be multiplicated by artificial intelligence. And I'm really skeptical that this problem can be solved by AI. No, human being, ethics, moral, this is human stuff. AI can be applied to, to, um, to analyze data, to see patterns that nobody has ever seen before. I'm thinking of traffic, traffic analyses um, of um, model, modeling of, of uh, weather forecasts, um, stock markets, and so on, but not for moral and ethics. Very comprehensive, thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Beck, I have uh, actually one question that I wanted to ask. Um, so we have quite a diverse audience um, here with us today. We've got uh, attendees from financial services, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, IT and, and technology, uh, professional services, just to name a few. Um, and so I was wondering, um, would you be able to share with us today um, some emerging uh, neuroscience applications um, for some of these industries, if you have some uh, different examples that uh, sort of come to mind? <laughs> Well, uh, what we know is that um, that you can use brain based principles in order to improve, improve, for instance, the innovation potential of companies. So there was a nice, um, a nice project we had in the financial industry here in Frankfurt, which is very finance, finance uh, based. And uh, the idea was, let's use the neuroscience principle of education for corporate learning systems. So instead of just having a classic, uh, a classic lesson to teach people finance stuff, let's put it the other way. How does the brain actually learns and understands? We are not learning, we are not learning by heart. You cannot basically use or, or cram knowledge into people's head. But the neuroscience principle of learning is asking questions and trying to find solutions in a new way. So why don't we put this interaction? So we designed uh, some kind of workshops where people were um, able to learn by actively dealing with the problem. So instead of saying, okay, I had a, th th this was a workshop about money laundering, which is a very dry topic. I have seen people falling asleep and falling from their chair during some kind of money laundering workshop. This is super boring. And we said, okay, let's turn it upside down. Neuroscience would say, okay, put people into an active role. You are, uh, you are a mafia boss. How would you wash your money? What would you do? And then you let people actively think about that. It can be very creative and very interesting, but you get people into an active role. You open the mind of people first. And then after that, after you, you, you create this curiosity, after that, you get the information to people. And this can be optimized by artificial intelligence. You can do webinars. You can do digitized. Um, digitized presentations of content and so on and so forth. But the beginning of every good idea is getting people into an active role. And this is, especially in the learning science, uh, over and over repeated in the last years in the neuroscience field. And this has to be put into action, especially in companies that put a lot of focus on corporate learning, for instance. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Um, I'm afraid that we're now uh, rapidly running out of time. Um, so I wanted to say that was an absolute fantastic session. Um, and on behalf of everyone at Podium and, and Zebra Insights, thank you very much for your presentation today. We really, really appreciated it. I also Th wanted to thank- Thanks a lot, likewise. Yeah. Wonderful. I also wanted to thank everybody in the audience as well um, for dialing in and participating. I was I was very pleased to see um, plenty of questions from the audience, and I I see that uh, none of them stumped you, Dr. Beck. So you've done you've done very well today. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thanks a lot. There, there will be a recording of this webinar available, um, and we'll send everybody in the audience a link uh, via the registered uh, emails. Um, and the last point I wanted to mention is that although we don't yet have a concrete date set, there will be uh, another a uh, next uh, Podium Time Zebra Insights talk coming soon. So uh, until then, stay tuned and stay healthy. Thank you very much.